culture um, if the perception of competition, even if it's not real or increased competition, is uh, transforming the way that they think about their work. For example, putting downward pressure on wages. Um, here in the agricultural sector, that some of the producers, even though they've been able to maintain an incredibly um, sort of dominant position talking to workers about the need to, you know, in this new environment where there's competition, the need to uh, press down on wages. And I'm wondering if any of your work has seen that as uh, an outcome of promoting competition, or even if it doesn't come to fruition. Thank you. In the front here. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Imanla, uh, a student. Uh, from the, I'm sorry, but from the uh, presentation in the morning, the first presentation, and this presentation this afternoon, and uh, from what uh, the contribution I've been listening to, I still believe that uh, uh, if we want to really uh, be sincere about tackling the problem of violence, which is really treated in the world, we need to be sincere about the root of violence. And this will lead us to uh, the issue of constitution again. And uh, when she was talking, I was listening and uh, I discovered that coming to the issue of competition policy, uh, I believe that there is still something wrong with our constitution. Because he was asking a question. And somebody talked about Kamelia. And uh, I was listening to somebody here who was saying our constitution is the best in the world. But the question, uh, or let me first of all put it that every constitution as I have has to, for every country, is supposed to be a supreme national constitution uh, to, to, to make people to live together harmoniously. And I feel very well that South Africa is a dynamic country. And every dynamic, dynamic country changes. My question is this. In a dynamic country like this, is there no need for constitution review or let me call it constitution uh, review committee that will be looking at the gap that dynamic changes create in this country? From a default to this time, there have been changes. And these changes are creating new demands from the common masses. And the new demands is creating some conflict and violence. And I feel uh, the Constitution has something to do with this. And we need to start to look at what are the rules in our Constitution. And uh, the question is, can't we have a strong constitutional review policy that will take care of all these problems and find a and open of a sincere, not a rhetoric solution to this problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see a hand in the back. Susan, did you have a hand up here? Uh, I see another hand over here. And two hands on the left side. So let's take everybody on this side and then you put that side. Uh, my name is Bechan from Mabungwe Institute. Um, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Uh, just a few points. Why? Uh, what's the objective of this competition? Police is it the traditional objectives that we know are going to theory? Does it have something to do with uh, the transformation as we want to know it from the constitution of South Africa? If that be the case, have there been successful stories or not? I think uh, that's my nice simple question. Thank you.
Sorry about this sound. Um, it's more a question of factory, uh, and it's really sort of a little bit off your paper, but um, after 1994, um, there was quite a lot of um, unbundling by large corporations, which sort of moves, supposedly moves the country in a more competitive direction. But I want to go back to what Sammy Gavin is talking about, the financialization. And the fact that it would seem that uh, more and more of the proportion of shareholdings are held by the financial institutions. So I'm just sort of asking you whether the Competition Commission actually has looked at the financial sector, um, uh, or whether it is simply being involved with corporations which are directly involved in production. I'm sorry, I'm back, sir. My name. Um, I just want to check uh, from the panel, you know, the extent to which the competition commission is uh, strong in dealing directly with the anti-competitive behavior, uh, collusion, and uh, negative tendencies of uh, uh, compromise. I I'm asking this precisely because in the recent past and since uh, the emergence of the Competition Commission, we have seen some of the companies that have been disciplined, you know, uh, factoring, you know, the amount, the fines, you know, into their balance sheet and continue, you know, smoothly with their business immediately after they've paid their fines and there's no consequences uh, for wrong behavior in particular, you know, their director. So that is what I'm also interested in. Uh, I also want to check with Simon Roberts uh, the role of monopoly capital, you know, whether it's progressive, you know, what lessons can we learn uh, within the context of the developmental state. Thank you. Let's give you the last question. Thank you, Ward Alcee, University of Victoria. I want to come back to the financialization process. Um, or what I would call an invisibilization of the accumulation process out I think that every um, example I was given here is a very interesting one. Every has been brought up by a consortium of international investors and has been delisted of the market. So controlled by this consortium by uh, uh, entirely. Now, it, we are almost sure that it will be relisted on another exchange, uh, stock exchange, probably Chicago where the same actors, including the South Africans, will accumulate, not in South Africa, but abroad. So the total invisibilization of the accumulation process, how are we going to deal with all these processes where the accumulation process becomes totally invisible and totally Thank you. Thank you. Adam's really wants well to start. I don't know how to start with so many questions. <laughs> so, much, right? so, okay, I'm going to start with the easiest one, the sentence one, the last one. <laughs> so, the Africa story, I think, is a really, if you want to take, uh, and, I, and I believe, I mean, this was from Gavin's point, I think real markets means going and looking and being an anthropologist about institutions and social relations, etc. And can you generalize? Well, to be honest, I even believe these sectors are important enough in themselves. So, uh, you may worry about it for themselves. And this whole point about generalization is something we think about a little bit differently. What we look for is patterns and interests. I think those are generalizable. The African story is, is really important, I think. Because the first thing that happened is your privatization of the co-ops. Then you had mergers. But each of the co-ops operated in a different area. They don't compete with each other. That's the design. Why have you know, two co-ops in one area? It's pointless. So then you have mergers, which in terms of the Competition Act are all approved. Why? Because they don't compete with each other. There's no lessening of competition through the mergers. So AFRI started with OTK, Eastern Transvaal, or Brazi, and then it buys up its neighbors. So it becomes much bigger. Then it vertically integrates up and downstream. So it goes backwards into a range of farming requisites, and it goes downstream into processing. And so you have this very big cooperative, a conglomerate that forms, and then it gets bought out by a foreign uh, entity and delisted, and, uh, and now you have the whole debate about financialization, which I believe is very important, but I, I think you know, this is a massive area to look at. Mergers aren't anti-competitive, and there's some public interest areas, but they are delineated. They're not about, there's not a foreign investment provision in our act. If you go to Australia or Canada, it's two very good examples, there's a separate foreign investment act. 
And you know, and some people say, but you must do it as the authority. No, you, Parliament passed the law. You chose what you wanted to give us powers to do. It's kind of it becomes this debate that you know is really problematic. It's almost as if you want to have a a, a blame hand. You say, well, how are we dealing with this? Well, we're not. The, authority, the competition authorities have got the job to do it. So it's not actually our problem. And then they don't do it. They say, oh, but they're not effective. No, no, no. You chose. We chose. You, we, us, we all chose the powers. So the AFPRI story is so important. But if you say, why did the competition authorities not intervene? It's because the powers that they were given do not extend to dealing with these issues of economic policy. And, and so there is a lacuna, there's a gap. But the gap is only recognized if you acknowledge the limited role the competition authorities were, were given. I mean, you know. I can tell you about Canada's Australian roles. They say, BHP Bulletin, they say, you will not merge and they should bring your head office to Australia. Could we do that? No, we said, go to London. We said, go to London to raise finance and then, and then go to Australia. Why? Because the Australians have a foreign investment act. I mean, you know, it's kind of, and then we said, well, why, why, why is the head office not coming back to South Africa? I mean, it's, a, it's kind of an old question, uh, really, how one looks at the powers. In terms of how we look at the financial sector, let me talk about, about that. I mean, and again, it shows about the scope and powers of the competition authorities. Their banking, the competition authorities did a banking inquiry, um, uh, and, uh, but there were no powers to do the inquiry. There were no powers, none whatsoever. It was just a kind of process, informal process, and some banks didn't want to comply with it. And now there are market inquiry powers. The health inquiry is having those powers, but they're having all of the litigation around how you, how you, how you conduct that. But is it important that it should be something that's looked at? Yes. And the question is, you know, should it be looked at by the competition authorities? Well, maybe. But then you have to give them a different role. Or should it be looked at by other institutions? So the competition authorities see the financialization. When the mergers come in, you see whether the acquirer is listed in the British Virgin Islands or in Mauritius. But is that a competition issue? No. And, and the question that really I want to ask is, where is the body that's actually tracking the changes in corporate ownership? and understanding what's happening in areas such as media or banking or finance. Because if you don't have information, then you know, you're obviously not really understanding what the picture, how the picture is evolving. And, and you know, the competition authorities see information as part of their role, but their role does not extend to addressing these things. And, and I think it's a problem that people think their role does extend because then the gap is sitting there uh, and, and, and not understood as a gap that needs to be needs to be filled. It becomes a very good cover for what is a deliberate <laughs> exercise, I think, in terms of what's going, 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 going on. I mean, the authority has the competition commission. And the authority has the possibility to launch investigations uh, without complaints. So Gavin's part of question about is it just a dialogue inside it? It is in terms of people that bring the complaints. Definitely, the big litigants are other companies fighting each other. The biggest litigants in media is Caxton's fighting Media 24, Media 24 fighting Caxton. Mm -hmm. um, but the authority has tried to bring um, cases um, which represent um, outsiders to go and look at uh, smaller players. But I mean, it's, 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 I'm not claiming any successes. Uh, just to say that there, there's, there's some scope uh, there. Um, and uh, leave it at that. We can debate further I mean, uh, afterwards. Okay, I think going to the point about linking this paper to um, the earlier paper and also just uh, thinking about violence, I and mean, I think that is an interesting point. Um, I think we haven't studied um, necessarily the dynamics of um, the conflict that happens within um, informal um, retail settings, uh, partly you know because of the way cases come to us um, and, and the way uh, one would think about um, competition um, issues um, strictly. But I think, I mean, at the core of cartels, at any level of sophistication, is about um, monitoring the adherence um, of those participants in the cartel to the agreement, um, which is where a lot of the information exchange comes in in the formal economy. And then it becomes about punishing those who deviate um, from, from the outcome. So usually punishment could be in terms of a targeted price war in the, 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 the deviating company. Uh, but even those cartels do sometimes rely on intimidation, um, on violence, even at those um, sophisticated levels. And I think that would build something uh, in terms of you know, whatever tools a cartel has um, at its disposal to punish uh, those who deviate, I think will be used. And I think in some settings would then uh, be consistently outright violence where um, less, I suppose, 
um, less violent means are, are available. Uh, but I must preface, and I preface it by saying that one doesn't actually know necessarily uh, the dynamics of those cartels um, in, in the um, informal um, sector. I mean, certainly the, the authorities haven't really um, had cases, so to speak, um, in that space. Um, there was a point made about social dialogue um, institutions being those of insiders. I think that's, that's um, you know, a, a theme that's emerging across many settings, and I think that's uh, very true in the sense of the way competition legislation came about, for instance. I think perhaps at the time there was a deal that everyone was satisfied in with, but everyone who was in the room and kind of not um, taking into account the interests of those outside the room principally the unemployed, um, entrepreneurs trying to enter into the economy. So that, you know, people sometimes call for an economic contessa, again, it's not here, that would be the solution, but certainly the current um, institutions that haven't really um, affected into account or interest in society. I think that the idea of wage pressure as a, a result of competition is an intriguing one. Um, I mean, I think what we try to highlight in some of the case studies is that in, in parts of the value chain, you would find that there is um, lack of power. So even in agriculture, you would find that the power is with the processors and the infrastructure owners, and not so much with uh, farmers. And so in being victims um, of anti-competitive arrangements or coordinated outcomes, um, they might be pushed into um, um, situations of wage pressure. Uh, not, not because they're facing greater competition, but because they're actually victims of um, anti-competitive outcomes. We tend to see the opposite, um, interestingly, that there, there is a tendency or, or that um, there is a willingness by some in big business to enter into um, wage agreements that would um, be difficult for smaller and, uh, companies to um, adhere to partly because they, they are making um, super profits and they're making um, high margins, and so they can afford certain kinds of wage settlements, which then um, lead into the, the, the bigger unemployment debate. I think that overall, that the issue there about the you know, like lack of flexibilities in the labor market and lack of flexibility in the product market is that I think it's an ongoing debate that keeps being a ping pong about uh, where is the source of the problem in terms of um, lack of employment, lack of um, competition, and whether wages are too high or in some instances too low. But I think what all of this suggests is that you can't look at the you know, wage markets in isolation of what's actually happening in the product markets and where power lies in product markets um, and where it doesn't. Thanks, Jim. Can we give Gavin the last word? That's the first week. But everyone said I'm hungry, so I'll be very fast. Just, just two responses, really. One response to Tara's question, a very good question. First, um, the, the role of violence in the form of trade. I mean, I think their employer, the role of African nation, is actually quite a good example of the use of violence against the form of trade. I remember in 2010, Sparza shops being demolished in Luka Village, for example, um, where very poor people were trying to make a livelihood, but the idea of the take on itself as functions of the state. And so you can't sign them there, people they said, well, we have to do this because you're not giving us business licenses because we're not physically connected. So perhaps you could refer your employees to the competition commission if they have a test case. Um, in respect of the question I was directly asked um, about neoliberalism, is there life outside of neoliberalism? Well, potentially, yes, because insofar as neoliberalism is, it, is the project of one class, and presumably the other class that it's having projects against and have projects of its own. And maybe you know, that, that is part of, of the possibility of what's been done in South Africa over the past two or three years, really, starting with the Maritana process, leading to uh, the movements of this race as a whole series of possibilities. It's not just about people talking about alternatives, but also possibly the agency to implement those alternatives. Thank you. Before we uh, close, we'll be for the just a very short announcement. Um, we have more issues to distribute. Um, I know that some of you haven't had any in their folders. So if you want to have a special issue, um, please go um, to the registration desk. But please, if you have walked into the room without registering your name, my because for your name and, and uh, signatures just while on the attendance registry. Uh, so we go from, we have only a limited number of them, but everyone will be able to get one. Um, so
theoretical framework or conceptualization of uh, neoliberalism from, from uh, the work of Grable, more specifically in connection with new classical macroeconomics, but it's extremely close to what was referred to this morning, um, in particular in the sense that we are not only looking at it uh, from the angle of ideology, but particularly from the angle of the set of practices and institutions and policies uh, that are implemented by these institutions. So the paper is uh, divided into four sections. We have a first section uh, on this whole argument uh, of uh, neoliberal deepening and how state intervention is very central to that. But as I said, I'm not going to deal with this now. I'm essentially going to focus on two aspects. The aspect of the conversion and uh, what um, Gabriel Palmer has uh, noted um, regarding what he calls the art of neoliberalism, which is uh, this um, capacity to achieve remarkable, I quote, asymmetric distributional outcomes within democracies, mostly by conviction. And I'm going to try and show uh, how this um, happened historically um, in terms of um, ANC, uh, the ANC leadership and its affinities with uh, the neoliberal agenda, with conservative macroeconomics, um, as well as, of course, with business. But I'm essentially, and that will be the, the same um, key uh, point in the presentation, going to show um, how, the, um, the, how this has been built on uh, the systematic capture, emergence, and building of a very um, strong um, public administration uh, in Treasury. So um, we just um, move on to um, the first um, I mean the, the issue of uh, the ANC's uh, historical affinities with um, orthodox economics. Um, but I'll just um, come back to one point which was, I think, made this morning, which we emphasized in the paper, uh, which is the fact that um, in South Africa as elsewhere, um, particularly in, uh, in Europe, um, it's particularly being the, the left um, and, and, and the role of the left in um, implementing and deepening the neoliberal agenda has been quite central. And it's, I think, very important to look at South Africa uh, from that angle. Um, specifically um, through um, the systematic implementation of um, state uh, reform um, and uh, more specifically even uh, through the implementation of uh, new public management across a range of public administrations. So if we um, think of this and now move to um, the, the democratic transition and uh, the role that the ANC has played in deepening agenda in South Africa. Um, it's quite important, as I think a number of um, speakers this morning um, insisted on, to um, realize that um, the historical affinities between uh, the ANC and orthodox and, and economics uh, are of course uh, nothing new. And a number of analysts have um, documented very convincingly that uh, they go way back and that a number of uh, factors has played a very important role in uh, strengthening uh, this adherence to um, orthodox macroeconomics uh, way before uh, the beginning of uh, negotiations. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just going to um, briefly here insist on the role play um, by Tabo Becky, who was referred to this morning, um, in uh, three different aspects, some of which have uh, been analyzed, others um, are less documented and less researched. Um, there's at least three different aspects in which Lepi's role was quite crucial um, and in, in um, promoting and um, ensuring the um, adherence and the conversion by conviction, which I was referring to earlier on. First of all, um, what should be considered is Becky's very uh, key role in uh, the shaping of the ANC internal agenda back in the 1980s. Perhaps more key than where his colleagues uh, in the ANC DEP at the time, uh, because of his own specific connections um, with international financial institutions um, in uh, the ANC uh, Department of International Affairs. Uh, and uh, with um, international finance, Goldman Sachs in particular, uh, this uh, range of personal connections were quite important. 
A second uh, very important aspect of Mbeki's role is um, the ability with which he has um, identified and positions a range of new recruits, uh, very key people, uh, and group them to very key positions which should prove uh, very, very important in the, firm, in the making of macroeconomic policy in subsequent years. I'm not going to um, cite them all, but I'm sure you all, all have them in mind. But it's quite important to see uh, here the fact that uh, these people were uh, at the same time um, very uh, legitimate politically, emerging political leaders with struggle credentials, but on the other hand, they were neither ideologues nor seasoned economists and were therefore more open to uh, ideas which